Yazd. The Emerald of the Desert is an oasis city deep in the heart of the desert in central Iran. This city has 3,000 years of history. Previously known as Isatis, the city's early records can be tracked to the time of the ancient Median Empire here in Iran. This magnificent oasis may be the most beautiful desert city in the world and has been constantly inhibited through its time. I'm Sahar Hakju and you're watching Aperture. Being remote and surrounded by killer deserts, Yazd has pretty much remained intact and is where the old traditions are kept alive to this day. In the labyrinthine alleys and passages of this vast and vital city, you can find the ancient Iran so eloquently immortalized in Persia's ancient scriptures and world-renowned poetry. Its clay-colored alleys and roofed bazaars have stood witness to centuries of history. Alexander the Great is said to have marched through the city on his way to India, and centuries later, Marco Polo got mesmerized by its unique architecture, not seen anywhere else. In this week's program, we travel to Yazd and follow a young Australian tourist as he explores the beauties of this ancient city. Stay with us. The ancient Iranians believed there were four elements of which everything was made – air, earth, water and fire. Air, or wind, represented movement. When the wind blows, one should expect change. Inertia, or the lack of movement, is a sign of death, and movement is life. Wind is the essence of movement and the dynamism of creation. A wind tower is the key element of traditional architecture in central Iran, and it serves as a mean to guide this life-giving source of energy into people's homes. The wind tower acts as an air vent to draw out the hot air from inside the living space. What is ubiquitous in traditional Iranian architecture is the use of the existing climate conditions to make life easier, and Iranian architects make best use of whatever Mother Nature has given us. Yazd has been given many names and epithets throughout its history, the most common of which is the City of Wind Towers. This is Yazd, and we are standing beside the wind tower of the Dalatabad Garden. The Dalatabad Garden of Yazd was built in the late Afshariya era by Muhammad Taghi Khan, the leader of the Han's tribe of Yazd. Muhammad Taghi Khan ordered the digging of a 65 kilometer aqueduct to bring the water from the mountains of Mehriz to the current Dalatabad Garden, so he would be able to build the seat of his power upon an oasis. The garden is divided into two parts, the interior and exterior. The exterior building is located in the east and has a pond and a high wind tower. The wind tower of the garden has the shape of a cylinder and, being 33.8 metres high, is the tallest mud brick wind tower in the world. So this, this is the uh, wind catcher here? Wind catcher, yeah. Its length is 34 metres <clears throat> and excavating a canal named Dolatabad. Later on, 
he commenced constructing the state of Dolatawa garden as his ridges along the stream extending from the Kanats. Okay. And uh, this, this, this particular... Uh, this was his summer palace summer. and the, in front you see that was winter. Okay, okay. And it has gardens of, uh, the gardens have pomegranate, uh -huh. grapes uh -huh. and fruits over yeah. here. Yeah. The Dolatabad Garden is regarded as the only really outstanding example of Zand-era architecture in Yazd. It also serves as a bridge linking the previous era to the next. The garden is located in the east of Yazd between Shahar Manar and Nasrabad neighbourhoods. It was built in the lunar year 1160 and it's one of the most magnificent and beautiful monuments of the Afshariya and Zand eras. The compound involves buildings, ponds and numerous fountains. In between them, there are gardens rich with pomegranate and grape trees, as well as numerous flower species that embellish the grounds of the Dolatabad garden. I became acquainted with Dasmati upon arriving in Yazd, a man typical of Iranians who kindly offered to accompany me. The story of my acquaintance with him is simple. Salam, how are you? Uh, Englishy, Baldi. Well, yes, I can speak English. All oh, right. So I was just uh, curious about these uh, carpets. I've never seen them like this before. Yeah, actually, this is not carpets. Oh no. No, this is this is all terme cloths uh -huh. made in Yazd. Uh -huh. Yes, is proud of itself. Uh -huh. I'll take you to Mr. Ustad Ramazan Rinzai. This guy here. And what, what is it exactly? This old man is saying, who is weaving this darai. His name is darai. Uh, the cloth names, usually they say darai. Uh -huh. Darai, the sentence, he, as he, he's saying that, the government government of Yaz brought some called some weavers right to his office. Okay. He told, "I will pay you some, and you go and practice for weaving." Okay. That money which he has given to the persons for this that has called darai. They went to their private houses and they started weaving cloths. Okay. That cloth was named as Darai. Right. Ustad Ramazan Rizai, bevaqshe da. I chand sal asho mai kar anjam bede. Kar? Ha, i kar. Hashtad pain jal sal. Hashtad pain sal. He is weaving over here with this uh, old machine since. Eighty-five years. Eighty-five years. Uh -huh. oh. How many? Chand sal tune. Hundred, hundred, hundred and one, hundred and two years his uh -huh. age. Uh -huh.
Yazd is regarded as one of the best preserved adobe, that is mud brick, cities in the world. It's also among the few large Iranian cities that have retained their historic features to this day. Researchers consider Yazd as one of the four focal points of civilization during the time of the Median Empire in the east of Iran. The layout of Yazd is highly interconnected, full of narrow, long, roofed alleyways. The other unique feature of Yazd is its use of very thick walls. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, <coughs> you have come to the place, yes, old texture, where the people from abroad come to see over here. Uh -huh. All from all over the world. Yeah. And this is the old texture of Yaz. Yeah. Not only Yaz, of Iran. It's it's <coughs> the pride of Iran. That's the place is the pride of Iran. Uh -huh. All passages, yards and buildings in Yazd are protected against the rough climate conditions, most particularly the hot and often dusty winds. Narrow alleyways are straddled by tall walls that create shade alongside the passage so that people are spared the oppressive rays of the desert sun. I have come back to Iran in search of relics of ancient civilization, which seem to be more freely available here than in any other country I've ever been. We began with Tehran for only one day, but we go back to Tehran for three days. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Ahvaz, the area of Ahvaz, uh -huh. and then uh, Chiraz, uh -huh. yes. Uh, very beautiful uh, city, uh, uh -huh. Chiraz, yes. Uh, um, impressing people are very kind. Everywhere welcome. Yeah. And yeah. we are very um, impressed and, comment um, dire, uh, ému. Yeah, it's a great emotion for us uh -huh, to uh -huh. discover uh -huh. your people uh -huh, yes. uh -huh, uh -huh. and the country, uh -huh. all the country. Are you mad? Yes, yes, how are you? The other friend who accompanied me in Yazd is Nasser. I was told about him in Tehran before my journey. Nasser had an encyclopedic knowledge of Iranian history and culture, especially that regarding Yazd. Water has long been considered the source of life. Ancient people in Iran believe that life is a place through which the water is flowing and that water is a symbol of purity and light. Heaven is also associated with water in all of Iran's religious scriptures. Many define water as awareness too, of hidden knowledge. For them, the water that flows on earth symbolizes something else, divinity. So this is, of course, a canat. Yeah. And then it's a kind of useful system mm -hmm. uh, back to 2,500 years ago. On that time, we live inside desert, yeah. so we need water from the mountain. Yeah. So uh, they start to dig the earth from the mountain to flat place, to have water to guide the water to flat place, and yeah. then the people can use this water here. Uh, the first hole, they should uh, dig the earth uh, vertically, yeah. and then they arrive to water. Yeah. Then they start to dig the earth horizontally, right. arrive to this area. 
every 50 meter they should dig another hole because they want to bring out the soil okay okay so yeah. that and they need light as well okay yeah. so that they uh, have different hole uh, across uh, the channel mm -hmm. if we collect all of these horizontal channel mm -hmm. and vertical channel we can go from earth to moon and back really yeah you mean in this one canal or no, all, the, all the canals all in the yes. canals in uh, in whole iran in iran uh -huh, yeah uh -huh. if we collect all of them we can go to moon and back <laughs> amazing it is pomegranate garden uh-huh they're pomegranate trees i didn't know what they looked like yeah you know, pomegranate is really famous in Iran, especially in Yazd, because uh, pomegranate is one of the uh, export fruits of Iran, especially from Yazd, uh -huh. because it's really famous <clears throat> here. Uh huh. Yeah, before I came to Iran, uh, I had no idea that pomegranates come from here, and I don't think many other people around the world do either. Yeah. I have a distinct feeling that I am now walking on a land under which there is a network of aqueducts. These are tunnels for the transportation of water that were built centuries ago, without any advanced tools. Tunnels for transferring the essence of life from the mountains and high places to the desert. The aqueducts of Yazd are as old as Iranian civilization itself. Indeed, the oldest aqueduct in the world can be seen here in Yazd. The ancient residents of Yazd developed innovative techniques to tackle the dryness and heat of Yazd and its surroundings, a hydraulic system for transporting the water. And aqueducts carry out this task of bringing water from the mountains to the farms. The point where the water rises from the ground is the source of the aqueduct. Now we are in front of a water reservoir. Uh -huh. So each water reservoir has uh, had three different part. Mm -hmm. The first part was look like this. Right. So you can see the steps here. The people should go down, arrive to the tap, uh -huh. and then they can take water from the tank. And uh, did they go down with buckets, or how did they get retrieve the water exactly? In a, uh, in ancient, the people can go down and arrive to uh, water, and with the bucket they can uh, take water. Uh -huh. But uh, from two hundred years ago, they changed the rule yeah. because they want to close the tank. Uh -huh. And with this kind of technique, it has a benefit for us because if you have any kind of disease, and then. Uh, you put your hand in, inside the water, you, cannot, uh, you can uh, spoil the water. Yeah. So that with this technique, they can uh, reserve the water fresh and then healthy. Yeah. So uh, it was really good technique to reserve water inside the tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After aqueducts were built and the water was canalized, people needed a way to store the water for the summer. So they invented a method of water storage. In these deep structures, the water is kept cold and dark to prevent it from spoiling. Okay. So what is this for? It was pie up. Uh, pie up means the water of canals uh -huh. came to this pool uh -huh. from this channel and then go out from the another channel. And they use this for? Washing themselves, wash dishes and cook. In Iran, water and storage so. depots, along with beautiful arches, wind towers and high domes, date back hundreds and often thousands of years. Water, birth and life are always intertwined. Each river or aqueduct leads you to an oasis and to renovation freshness and birth. The infertility treatment and research clinic of Yazd was established in 1989. The clinic's mission was to treat infertility in Iran 
by using the latest technology and to pave the way for the development of this know-how in Yaz province and across the country. Okay, so um, this is the IVF Research Centre, I'm told. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do here? Yes, uh, actually it's clinical and research centre. Uh -huh. Both clinical. together. We are going to the services to the patient, infertile couple, uh -huh. and also some research to know more about the, some problem about infertility. Okay, yes. right. And um, how does it work exactly? Can you explain to me roughly? Yes, this is the uh, special isolated part of the lab. is uh -huh. for PND, prenatal diagnosis. Okay. And uh, that yeah. means we are going to pick up the, some uh, liquid from the for, uh, around the fetus uh -huh, uh -huh. during the pregnancy uh -huh. from the mother. Okay. Uh -huh. And when we pick up in the liquid from the uh, around the fetus, yep. we are going to test it for the expected gene abnormality or chromosome abnormality. Okay. Right. If it is right, it's yep. okay. The pregnancy ongoing is continuous. Okay. But it's finding the problem about that uh -huh. we can. The, the aborted the, uh -huh. the, the abnormal fetus. Uh -huh. Also, the other part, we are going to do some postnatal diagnosis as well. Right. After the birth, After I birth. mean. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the infant, maybe adult, yep. using the blood sample, using the bone marrow, depend on the cause of the, we are looking for that. Uh -huh. What we do, we do, we induce uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the hemorrhage inside the skull. Uh -huh. and, yeah, uh, and um, it, 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 that that project, uh, which recently was finished and the work was published in the American Journal, really? was uh, yeah, it uh, took place here for the first time. First, and, uh, for the first time in the world. In, in the world, yes, really? yes, in yes. yes, exactly. That's amazing. And uh, recently. We uh, finished another project uh, that was the, the, the therapeutic benefit of uh, stem cell for head trauma. The head trauma okay. took place in rat again. Okay. And uh, the work is uh, new. It, it's been presented in international congresses and uh, it's been submitted for uh, publication. Uh, we have uh, uh, very good uh, expert uh, gynecologists, embryologists, uh, urologists. Yeah. So um, uh, I would say this is one of the most famous centers uh, in Iran. And we have patients from all over the country. Also, we have uh, some patients coming from uh, Arabic countries. Um, I am a genetic counseling in the recurrent abortion clinic and uh, genetic uh, disorder clinic. The most uh, patients comes to me. Uh, they have a, um, they are a couples. Uh, they suffer from recurrent abortion. This is a big problem in our uh, uh, center about the from infertility. What, what type of abortion do you say? Uh, spontaneous oh, recurrent uh -huh, abortion. Recurrent. Uh -huh, yes, uh -huh. this is a spontaneous uh -huh. uh, and. Um, uh, because they uh, didn't uh, have a chance to have a baby, uh, they come to uh, solve their problem. Uh, we um, try to help them about uh, to finding their problem first and then uh, treat them uh, to they can have a, a normal baby or sometimes we decided to they have uh, another uh, choice for um, egg donation, embryo donation, or adoption. Uh -huh. Sometimes this is our uh, results in so the end. just out of curiosity, like for example, say you get 100 patients uh, and they have 100 problems, how often is it that through uh, this kind of treatment or diagnosis that uh, you cannot help them at all, that they, they um, must adopt? According to our records, um, Nearly 80% of the patients comes to us, they have a baby now. Zainuddin Caravan Sarai. It's the only round-shaped caravanserai that has survived and dates back to the Safavi era, roughly four centuries ago. 
Zainuddin Caravanserai was relaunched after restoration in early 2004 and won an award from UNESCO for being the year's best restored historic monument. Lonely Planet has described Zainuddin Caravanserai as one of the top five tourist attractions of Iran. This caravanserai was built upon the order of the ruler of Kerman, Ganjali Khan Rik, who himself had received orders to this effect from the Safavi king, Shah Abbas the Great. At the time, armed guards loyal to the Shah were stationed there. Today, however, it is used for the accommodation of tourists wishing to stay in an exotic locale. Being here really gives you the feeling that you have travelled back in time. Each of the chambers gives you the feeling that you are resting in a caravanserai which is a part of history. Oh wow, this is amazing. Yeah, this caravan survey is unique because uh, the plan of this caravan survey is circle. Uh -huh. So that's, uh, it's unique because we don't have any kind of caravan survey in circle shape. This is the only one in Iran? Yes, uh -huh. it's only one in Iran. And why did they decide to build this one in a circle? Because they want to have a new plan for a caravan survive, and because of that, you can see uh, they build it in circles. Uh -huh. So it's... Just to impress people that they could do something different. Yeah. 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 And this open roof, uh, seeing as it's in the middle of the desert, I assume that uh, at night time you get some views of the stars? Yeah, exactly, because uh, on that time, the people sleep here during summer, uh -huh. so that uh, they can sleep here, they can uh, look at the stars, yeah. and they can see millions of stars on top yeah. of their head. Yeah. And nowadays, uh, people want to come here and stay here to visit these uh, stars here, and so that it's really nice. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine it's popular. It really looks uh, so authentic. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy I'm staying here. That's for sure. According to legend, Siavash waded through the fire on his horse and emerged from it without any harm coming to him. Not a single lock of his hair was damaged, nor that of his horse. This happened under the order of God, and all the people were shocked. The Zoroastrian priests plucked a portion of that fire and took it to their temple, where the flame is still burning today. We are in fire temple. Mm -hmm. This fire burned about 1,530 years. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, it's the symbol of light for Zoroastrian people. Every day, uh, early in the morning and the eve in the evening, uh, somebody should come here and put wood on top of this uh, fire to burn. And then during these years, they keep this fire to burn. Uh -huh. And then they keep fire because they think that uh, fire can give them light and fire can clean everything. Yep. So that's it's the important fire for them. Cleaning and, and rebirth or yeah. a new beginning? Pure everything. Purification. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. They have ceremony behind these doors. Mm -hmm. uh, they can stand there next to each other and uh, Mubet come here to read Adasta for them and they uh, review the Adasta and it's their, it's their ceremony. My friend invited me to eat with his family, together with his wife, daughter, son and grandchildren. Although all Iranians are renowned for their traditions of hospitality, Yazdis have a special reputation for being friendly to guests. They listen to you carefully and even if they do not understand your language, they will try to speak to you in their own language. Maybe one of the reasons for the diversity of the Yaz suites is the hospitality of the people. Diversity is the smell and form for entertaining guests. You must see the confectionery store firsthand to appreciate how much delicacy and patience it takes to bake them. You might be knowing that uh, Yaz is especially famous for its 
sweets. Yeah, I've heard this. Yeah. Uh, different kind of sweets, such yeah. as bakala, kofta, cakes, etc., etc. Yeah. Uh, and this, what, are, what are we looking at here? Uh, this gentleman is preparing uh, kofta. Uh huh. And it's famous sweets in uh, Yazd. And is this made only in Yazd or? Only in Yazd. Making traditional sweets calls for much patience and above all experience. Cardamom, rose water and pistachio nuts are the primary flavours used for the sweets in Yazd. They say they taste like the colours of Persian architecture. They repeat themselves but are still fresh each time. Zulkhaneh, Persian for House of Strength, is the traditional Persian gymnasium. Zulkhaneh's were built mostly in alleyways away from the public's gaze. The Zulkhaneh activities have roots in the history of ancient Iran and the ancient Persian houses of worship. The round shape of the Zulkhaneh is a symbol of the sun and a sign of unity. In these sports, ethics is the most important thing. Older athletes are expected to have higher ethical virtues and they serve as role models for the younger ones. The more shed is a man with a melodious voice. He beats his tambourine in tune with his songs one for each of the different exercises. He typically chooses his songs from the ancient epic poems, usually from Ferdowsi's epic masterpiece, the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings. Hundreds of years ago, the Morshez would be the most agile and well-trained of the athletes. Ancient Iranians regarded earth as a symbol of fertility and growth. Religious scriptures describe the earth as the raw material used to create human beings. Of the four elements, it is the one from which humanity has sprung, with all its capability for growth and change. Earth shapes the water, wind dries it, and fire bakes the shaped earth. Artists of this land use all four elements. Uh, when did they first start making pottery like this in Iran? It is a really hard question because uh, in research around uh, Baluchistan, mm -hmm. in south uh, southeast of Iran, yeah. they find uh, some kind of fault mm -hmm. uh, back to 7,000 years ago. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I cannot say exact yeah. uh, time, exact uh, time of pottery because yeah. it's really but a very, a very long time ago. Yeah, exactly.
Maywood is really famous about the pottery and ceramics. Mm. Because we have a lot of clay here around this area. Um, is there and is there any significance to uh, what he's drawing, or is he just doing his own designs? Or no, it's not uh, his own design. It's uh, back to their culture, uh, and it shows different thing. I mean, look at their song because they have uh, 300 days sun here, so that is really good uh, symbol from. Uh, this city. Yeah. Maybod is located in the northwest of Yaz province on the road to Esfahan. The word Maybod is itself very old and its use dates back at least 1,500 years. The Aran Castle in Maybod is of very special importance to historians and archaeologists as it stands as a physical testament to the development of Iranian civilization. Like a broken, silent old man, this ancient fort has recorded the memories of the good old days and indeed the bad old days of peacetime and wartime in Yazd. So you can see uh, 4,000 history here in this wall. Uh -huh. 4,000 years ago, we mix uh, grass and mud together with water yeah. without any shape. We put it on top of each other. Then after that, in 2,500 years ago, we gave them shape. Right. I mean, 40 centimeter length, 20 centimeter wide, and 10 centimeter height. These are these ones here. Yes, exactly. And then after that, in Islamic period, yeah. uh, they changed it, mm -hmm. and then they gave them. A, uh, they became smaller, and then 35, 35 feet, five centimeter height. Uh -huh. You can see it here. These ones here. Uh -huh. um, and can you explain to me the? Uh the, the construction of the place, why it is built the way it is exactly? Yeah, they uh, build it in five different levels uh -huh. because on that time our society divided to five different groups. Uh -huh. So they want to uh, separate from each other. Right. The first level was for normal people and second par part was for a uh, farmer. Yeah. And then uh, third for a uh, soldier uh -huh. and for for rich people, uh -huh. and the uh, fifth was for our king. Uh -huh, the so, king and the royalty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that they can uh, live in different part of uh, um, castle. Yeah. And then with tall wall and tower, they can protect uh, from the enemy. Right. So it. So the most important people, so to speak, can stay at the top, uh, in the safest place. Exactly. Yeah. The fort dates back more than three thousand years and was used by every dynasty in Iran's history. Like most fortifications, it was built on high ground so that it could be more easily defended. Narin Castle is one of the few remaining mud brick forts in Iran, still standing firm despite the numerous conflicts and changes of dynasties it has seen. The local legend of Narin Castle goes something like this. The castle was built during the time of the Prophet Solomon. At the time, Fars was the seat of power for the Prophet Solomon. He ordered monsters to build a fort in a mountain so that his treasure could be defended. A monster named Dahl reached this mountain and Solomon was notified. Solomon instructed Dahl to build a fort from clay and stone. When Solomon died, the fort rocked to and fro. So, uh, you can see it's old part of city. Yeah. And then uh, they build this castle on top of a hill mm -hmm. because they want to see any kind of movement around themselves yep. and it was really best technique to uh, protect their castle. Maybod's caravanserai is known as the Shah Abbas caravanserai and was built 400 years ago over the top of a pre-existing one. This caravanserai is square-shaped with a central yard, 
Its huge wooden door helped to provide security from bandits. The grounds of this caravanserai and its perimeter involve ivans and both open and roofed spaces. The yard has 24 chambers, but the number of bed chambers reaches 100 if we include those deeper inside. There is also a small pond in the centre of the yard through which the aqueduct flows. Okay, it was a caravanserai. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And Shabbos start to build this caravanserai around Iran. Yep. I mean, 999 caravanserai in Iran territory. Yep, on the Silk Road. On Silk Road Way, uh -huh. exactly. Uh -huh. And I guess by the looks of things, this is one of the biggest, the more grand looking uh, caravanserais. Yeah, exactly, because uh, Maywood was a uh, important city on that time. Yep. And it located on a conjunction yep. of a north to uh, south, east to west, yep. so that all the people want to uh, pass through this uh, desert way. And these are all places to sleep? Exactly. Or, or shops maybe? or And it was look like shops because uh -huh. they can put their goods in front of their room uh -huh. and then they can trade with each other. Uh -huh. There are other buildings in the surrounding areas that were built over time for the welfare of the caravans. They include the source of the aqueduct, a water tower, a water storage depot, a post office, an adobe fridge, and a cemetery. The Chapa Khane, or post office, dates back to the Achaemenid era, around 2,500 years ago. The Chapa Khanes were tasked with keeping and looking after fast horses and fresh messengers, so that important letters and parcels could be sent as quickly as possible. Because of their importance to the rulers, they too were built as small forts. They typically featured high lookout towers and high walls, with spaces from which to shoot arrows. Meiboz Chapachane has been restored and now serves as a postal museum. All right. yeah. So this is a post office apparently, yeah? Yeah, in 2,500 years ago, our emperor uh, forced all of the minister should take his force just in seven days in all the territory of Iran, from Roma to India. Uh -huh. You mean they should be able to travel that distance in seven days? Exactly. Besides the Shah Abbas Caravan Sarai, there is a yellow cylinder-shaped dome that formerly serves as a refrigerator, made completely out of adobe. The main components of the fridge are the ice pond, the shade-giving wall, the storage area, and the high dome. The monument was used for making and keeping ice, and given the geographical location of the region, keeping large amounts of cold water was an enormous aid to the development of civilization. It is one of the few surviving layer, ancient fridges of Iran. Layer, we are in front of Jama Mosque. It has tallest menorah of Iran. And really? Then, yeah. Uh -huh. The height is 52 meters from top to floor. Uh -huh. This mosque back to 800 years ago. Okay. Uh, but the reconstruction 600 years ago again. And who, who was responsible for, for building it? Uh, Cedric Nadine, in, uh, he was a uh, lawyer of Yaz, and uh -huh. then in 600 years ago, he paid to reconstruction here. Okay, okay. Totally. Okay. This door, back to 600 years ago, uh -huh. uh, before the reconstruction, this door with nail and iron. Okay. Uh, it was a different part of the wood, they put next to each other, 
uh, look like puzzle. Uh -huh. And then if they want to reconstruct it, they can bring it out and put another piece inside it. Just in the ceiling, on the ceiling, you can see 110 different name of God. On this ceiling up here? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, they put different bricks yeah. next to each other and uh, look like a square. Yep. So that you can see 110 different name of God okay. on the ceiling. Right, right. Uh, look at that the small window in front of us. The one at the top? Yeah. 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 Under that one, you can see three different alley. Under those two alley, you can see the symbol of area. Yeah, Did you say? We, we call that a swastika. Swastika. Yeah. 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 It's the symbol of Aryan people. When would have this particular, when would this ceiling have been built? When, when would that swastika? 600 years ago. Uh -huh. But they want to show us. Uh, we are Aryan and then uh -huh. we are Muslim together. Uh -huh. So 600 years ago they had this idea. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. The most outstanding part of the Grand Mosque of Yazd is the Iwan, the dome section and the surrounding landscape. The high Iwan is dawned with a set of very beautiful mosaic tile works and arabesque decorations. These decorations with vault and pending pictures, as well as mosaic tablets and Kufic writing, have created a spectacular landscape that draws the admiration of many visitors. Oh, actually, English Bali. Can I talk to you for a minute? Yes. Oh, my name is Matt. What's your name? Uh, I'm Arash. Ah, Arash. Cool. I'm just curious. What What are you What are you doing here? Uh, actually, I'm just trying to uh, have some uh, shapes on these footages. Uh, I'm actually an industrial designer student. Uh huh. And uh, studying at the uh, Chaisaduri Technical University. Uh huh. So we thought that maybe these uh, shapes and geometries has been used in here it might be useful for our job. How, how are these uh, shapes applicable to industrial engineering? Uh, basically industrial design and uh, actually it contains some geometry. Geometry is basically made of triangles, rectangles, mostly circles. Uh -huh. So these shapes are the main shapes that have been used in this architectural design. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Nice You're to welcome. meet you. Yes. See you later. Bye bye. See you later. Yazd is the city of wind, water, fire and earth. It was an amazing discovery coming to this place. I truly felt transported back to another time, and all with no people preying on me as an unsuspecting tourist.